In December, we launch a podcast called Into the Killing. In each episode, we discuss at least one cold case that was eventually solved. Recently, we started making the episodes of the podcast in the full criminally listed style videos. In the last video we posted, we discussed the murder of Sherry Rasmussen. In 1986, she was one of 831 people who were murdered in Los Angeles, California. After 20 years, it seemed like the case would never be solved. But, when the case was solved, it shocked the citizens of the City of Angels. We'll have another video coming out this Sunday about the brutal murder of Larry Dickens. The killer's apprehension seems like it should be the conclusion, but it only led to a larger mystery that remains open to this day. Of course, you can still download the podcast episodes from Amazon Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and anywhere you find great podcasts. In our latest episode, we talk about the murders of two women in Colorado. Sadly, the delays in catching their killers would have unforeseen and dire consequences. But before we get into today's video, we just want to bring you a word from our sponsor, Scentbird. I think that Scentbird is one of the coolest and most unique subscription services available. For just $16 a month, you choose a new desired fragrance to try out. I think it's great because some fragrances cost hundreds of dollars. Imagine spending that type of money and getting sick of the fragrance after just a few weeks. Every month, Scentbird sends you a large sample, which is about 8 times bigger than a regular sample, and it usually lasts 30 days. Being able to change up your scent every month is a lot of fun, not just for you, but for the people around you who smell you. It's also easy to upgrade, so you can get 2 or 3 bottles a month. Also, if you find something you really like, you can get a bigger bottle from Scentbird. Scentbird has an amazing collection of colognes, perfumes, and unisex options from top brands like Versace, Gucci, and Prada. They also have some cool indie labels like Confession of a Rebel and The Harmonist. This month, I received Dolce & Gabbana's The One for Men, Prada's Luna Rossa, and Opulent Wood by Maison Sabriand. I'm not big on brand names, but I'm absolutely obsessed with the Prada cologne. It has this amazing citrus note that's really refreshing. I work alone, but I put the cologne on every morning because I love how it smells. So, like I said earlier, Scentbird is only $16 a month and you get a decent amount of top-end fragrance. But, Scentbird is offering criminally listed viewers a special offer. Make sure you use my coupon code CL2 for 30% off and take a simple quiz on Scentbird. The link is in the description below this video. They also have a great app which you can download via the link below this video. Check out Scentbird so you can start smelling like a million dollars for just a few dollars a month and you'll be supporting criminally listed in the process. Number 3. Andrea LeBay In December 2004, 47-year-old Brian Langer and 26-year-old Andrea LeBay lived on a quiet street in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. The couple had three children, 3-year-old Zoe, Bridget, who was turning two that month, and 7-month-old Margot. Brian was a successful businessman. He was the president of a company that sold software used in the printing of direct mail. He was called caring and professional. Andrea stayed home with the children, which she understandably found difficult. She was often tired and stressed out from dealing with the three children who were three and under. On December 1st, 2004, a call came in to 911 from the family's home. It was 47-year-old Brian Langer. He said that his wife had stabbed him in the stomach. First responders raced to the family's home. What they found left them all shaken. Brian was in his bed, bleeding from his stomach. Three-year-old Zoe and Bridget, who was nearly two, were in their bedroom. They were bleeding from their throats. Zoe did not have any vile signs, but Bridget did. Seven-month-old Margot was unharmed in her bedroom. The dog had even been attacked. On the main floor was the body of 26-year-old Andrew LeBay. Andrea, Brian, Zoe, and Bridget were all rushed to the hospital. Andrea, Brian, and Zoe were all pronounced dead not long after arriving. 
Bridget regained consciousness and underwent emergency surgery. She ended up spending her second birthday in the hospital, but she ultimately survived. The police were able to piece together what happened that morning. While Brian was in bed, Andrea stabbed him in the stomach. She then walked by baby Margot's bedroom and went into the bedroom of her two eldest daughters. While they were sleeping, Andrea slit Zoe's throat and then stabbed Bridget in the throat. Andrea then went downstairs and slit her own throat. What the police couldn't understand was why Andrea tried to kill most of her family. Many people thought that Andrea was suffering from postpartum depression and that contributed to the murder-suicide. But the police would not comment on that. After the tragedy, a family member said that they would adopt Bridget and Margot. Number 2. Jacqueline Fusen In 1988, the Fusen family lived in Los Chavez, New Mexico, which is a community about 30 miles south of Albuquerque. The family, which had lived in Carlsbad, New Mexico, moved into a modest pink stucco house about two years earlier. 45-year-old Thomas and 38-year-old Jacqueline had four children. Christopher was their oldest, and he lived in Alamogordo, New Mexico, which is about 180 miles from Los Chavez. 18-year-old Johnny, 12-year-old Mammy, and 10-year-old Amanda all lived at home. Thomas worked as a plumber, but he was having health problems. He needed surgery for a hernia. He had also been laid off a few times in the last several months. At around 8.30 a.m. on Tuesday, April 5, 1988, a neighbor found 38-year-old Jacqueline on her front doorstep. She was dead with a bullet wound in her chest. On her lap was a 22 caliber revolver. The neighbor called the police. Inside the master bedroom, they found the dead body of 45-year-old Thomas. He had been shot twice in the chest and once in the head. In another bedroom was the dead body of 18-year-old Johnny. In a third bedroom were the bodies of 12-year-old Mammy and 10-year-old Amanda. All three of the children had been shot in the head once. It appeared that Thomas and the children were all shot on Sunday night while they slept. Then, Jacqueline lived in the house with the dead bodies of her family for a day. She then took her own life on Monday night or Tuesday morning. Before Jacqueline shot herself, she wrote two letters. One was a short note explaining what should be done with the property and the dog. The second letter was addressed to the surviving Fusen son, Christopher. In the second letter, Jacqueline wrote about the family's financial problems. She wrote that Thomas needed surgery, but they didn't have any money to pay for it. She wrote that she was tired of living under the stress caused by the financial problems and she didn't see any other way of dealing with it. She also wrote about how much she loved her children and how close her family was. She said she didn't want to see her family live apart. Finally, she wrote that she hoped that her family would meet later and be together and they wouldn't suffer anymore. Everyone who knew the family was shocked by the tragedy. Jacqueline's family said that they knew that she and Thomas were having money problems, but they never suspected that something like this would have happened. Number 1. Susan Hendricks Liberty is a small city in northwest South Carolina. In 2011, it only had a population of about 3,200 people. The Hendricks family lived in two mobile homes on a quiet rural street in Liberty. 48-year-old Susan Hendricks and 52-year-old Mark Hendricks had been married for seven years. After they got divorced, they continued to be friends. 
they had two sons, 23-year-old Matthew and 20-year-old Marshall. Matthew was a welder who was planning on opening his own business. Marshall was an artist and he was getting ready to get married. Susan lived with her 64-year-old stepmother, Linda Burns, and her eldest son, Matthew. Susan's ex-husband, Mark, lived in a trailer next door. Marshall had been living on his own, but on October 12, 2011, he moved into the trailer where his father lived. Early on the morning of October 14, 2011, a call came in to 911 from a woman named Evelyn Burns. She is the sister of Susan Hendricks. Evelyn told the 911 operator that her entire family was dead. She was calling for the mobile home where Susan, Linda, and Matthew lived. When the first responders got there, they found 23-year-old Matthew dead in his bed. He had a gunshot wound on the side of his head. On the table next to his bed was a 380 caliber handgun. In another bedroom was the dead body of Matthew's step-grandmother, 64-year-old Linda Burns. She had been shot in the abdomen. Susan was unharmed and she told the police that Matthew had shot himself. Susan gave the police a suicide note that had Matthew's signature on it. She said she found it on the kitchen counter. Evelyn told the police that they should probably check next door. Several officers went to the mobile home on the neighboring property. On the front porch, wrapped in a blanket, was the dead body of 20-year-old Marshall. Like his mother and step-grandmother, he had been shot to death. In the mobile home, on the couch, was the dead body of Matthew and Marshall's father, 52-year-old Mark. Both Marshall and Mark had been shot in the chest. The police interviewed the sisters, Evelyn and Susan. Evelyn explained that she had been at her own home when Susan called her and told her that Matthew had shot himself. She drove directly over and saw the dead bodies. She then called 911. Susan said that Matthew had a history of suicidal thoughts and substance abuse. She said that the last time she saw her family was several hours earlier when they had prayed because Matthew was upset because several people had forgotten his birthday. The police initially thought it could have been a murder-suicide, but they weren't entirely convinced. One odd thing was that the gun belonged to Susan and she usually kept it in her nightstand. Also, if Matthew shot himself in the side of the head, how did the gun get to the nightstand? Wouldn't it have been in his hand? Or wouldn't it have been on the mattress where his body was found, or on the floor beside the bed? The nightstand seemed like a strange place to find the gun. So the police brought in forensic experts, and they did several tests. They noted that Matthew didn't have any gunshot residue on his hands or his clothes. But Susan's clothes were covered in gunshot residue. Also, Susan had recently taken out life insurance policies on her family and they all named her as the beneficiary. In total, she was going to get over $700,000. The investigators looked at Susan's medical records and found out that she was very mentally ill. A week before the murders, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. She had also been receiving psychiatric treatment since the 1990s. Since 2002, she had been off work on disability because of her psychiatric problems. But perhaps what was most troubling was that Susan had killed a man before and she bragged about getting away with it. On April 13, 2006, about five and a half years before the mass shooting, the police were called to the same mobile home where Susan was living in 2011. When they arrived there, she was standing on her front porch with a revolver in her hand. 
Susan claimed she was getting ready to go out to take food to a family friend. Then suddenly, a neighbor who lived on the same road about half a mile away, 39-year-old Doyle O'Brien Teague, forced his way into her home. Susan said she told him to leave, but he refused to go, so she shot him. Susan claimed that she was acting in self-defense. The police never learned why Teague was in Susan's home. They also couldn't find any evidence to refute Susan's story about him entering her home without permission, so she wasn't charged with anything. The police ultimately concluded that Susan killed her stepmother, ex-husband, and her two sons for the insurance money. She was arrested nine days after the murders. In April 2013, about two years after the murders, Susan pleaded guilty but mentally ill as part of a plea agreement. In the lead up to her sentencing trial, she was examined by a psychologist. The psychologist testified that before the age of 14, Susan had suffered horrible physical and sexual abuse at the hands of several family members and other people who knew her. The psychologist said it was some of the worst abuse he had ever heard of. He thought that Susan had post-traumatic stress disorder, dissociative identity disorder, and several other mood disorders. Had Susan been found guilty of first-degree murder, she could have been sentenced to death. Instead, because of the plea agreement, she was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. At the time of this video, 58-year-old Susan Hendricks is serving her sentence at the Camille Graham Correctional Center in Columbia, South Carolina. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Don't forget to check out her podcast, Into the Killing. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.